right here. Pictures from Oakland, California earlier today where another Occupy movement took off. Now, since the movement began last year, uh, we've covered it quite a bit on this program from the birth of the movement back in the fall through the protesters forced eviction from Zuccotti Park to all the arrests. And there was some pretty serious stuff that came out. Now, throughout, we have seen a pretty constant mean, 99% versus the one. So in that same spirit, um, we had our own debate here where Kim Lungle went out with our own Richard Brodsky, uh, as well as uh, who represents the 99, and we were also joined by someone who represents the 1%. The debate was, um, and the objective of it, the movement. How much has it changed the dialogue, um, and how much uh, and who relates to really which side. I'm going to bring that in one second, but as I promised, I want to bring in uh, you, the audience, right now. Let's begin with Mark from New Jersey. Um, and Mark, you see our question here in that gap of have and have nots. Is that just, hey, capitalism, God bless it, that's what a uh, consequence of us, or have things gotten too far? Well, I, I do believe things have gotten way too far. Uh, wealth is, uh, is uh, the, the majority of wealth is, is is held by one percent of the people, and uh, what what this is what the strike is saying to me today in Occupy Wall Street is that uh, we the people, the ninety nine percent, want to govern ourselves, and we do, and we don't want to be under corporate rule. Uh, right now, what I see is the corporate rule, but I see a whole lot of us out there in the streets. Unfortunately, I couldn't be there tonight, uh, but I do support it. And yes, the, the gap is is uh, way way too big. I believe this is about supporting democracy. All right, Mark. Uh, now, I mentioned before, and thank you for the phone call, we'll be getting to more, as well as also to some more of your comments you've been sending in via Facebook and Twitter in a second. But that debate I mentioned, 99%, um, a good friend, Richard Brodsky, and um, as you may know, Richard served in the New York Assembly for more than 25 years. He's packed a lot of uh, legislation, including landmark reform um, relating to abuses of power and government. And he's been very invested with the Occupy movement from the beginning. Um, and he represents one side. On the other side of the debate, uh, for the 1%, if you will, Tom Basile. He serves as executive director for the New York State Republican Party. He's co-founder of one of the nation's first independent and high-profile Tea Party organizations. And he was one of only two American conservatives featured in Time's Person of the Year edition about uh, activism on that side. All right. So Kim Lengel, um, who you've seen at the beginning, you'll see her later on the show, she went down to lower New York and she tried as best she could uh, to mediate the debate. Take a listen for yourself. So the first question is, we're going to get 60 seconds to respond. First question goes to you, Richard. Do you think Occupy Wall Street has been successful? Enormously successful. And the best way to see that is how Occupy Wall Street changed the debate. A year ago, we would be talking about austerity and out of control government. Now we talk about the problems of the 99%, how government and the corporate sector have turned their back on the vast majority of Americans and frankly people around the world. That stemmed from Zuccotti Park. That began here. The concern about returning public institutions to doing things that are in the public interest began here. It's been an enormous success. Tom, what do you think? Occupy Wall Street has been successful at sort of forming a bridge for this administration between the public employee unions and the White House so that they can try and add a color of legitimacy to this idea and this language that we're hearing a lot about from the president about fairness and about income redistribution and income Fast inequality. But discourse. at the same time, we've missed a lot of opportunities because of the crime, because of the rapes, the drugs, all of the arrests uh, and the vandalism. We've missed, missed a lot of opportunity to talk about some really important issues that I think Richard and I might actually agree on that need to be discussed in American politics. So they been, failed on both This on has both been counts. one of the most peaceful uh, movements uh, in the history of the world. The notion that there's rape and crime. Peaceful. I, I, during one protest, we had 700 arrests. Yeah, uh, the, uh, peaceful those, those meaning in the sense nonviolent. This was not a violent movement. We can't separate move the message from the messenger. I'm We're sorry. now talking about the Buffett rule. Is it more about fairness or class warfare? Tom, you have 60 seconds. It's far more about class warfare. And you know what? I love the fact that they call it the Buffett rule. It makes me laugh every time because here's a guy who used insider information to make millions of dollars off of the Wall Street bailout. He's the poster child for crony capitalism, but suddenly now he's a liberal hero. I'm not so sure I understand what the personal attack on Warren Buffett 
establishes for the question. Um, he's not a criminal n any more than Occupy Wall Street was. He's, done, he's been a tremendously successful businessman, and he has a point of view. That point of view is he should not be paying a tax rate lower than his secretary. Look, the Buffett rule, even by liberal estimates, will bring in about $80 billion a year. The government spends $4 billion a day, so any third grader can do the math. All right. Now, the next question posed for these two was whether or not um, the growing gap that we've been talking about between have and have nots is just, as we said, a byproduct of capitalism, or does a lot of the fault here with that gap lie with the 1%? As you can see, there was not a consensus with our two participants. The capitalism is equal opportunity, but not equal outcome. That was what this country was founded on. You go to, it's not, communism is equal opportunity and equal outcome, all right? Our, our system enables people to move within the system, all right? But we do have a problem when you've got corporations and folks making money that are being backstopped by the taxpayer unfairly, and you've got a problem when you have a class of bureaucrats and public employees unions that are the dominant force in deciding the direction of our government. It is not a question of six public sector unions somehow ruining the country. The concentration of wealth is the problem, not individuals who work for government. Well, you must have voted for a lot of those contracts in Albany, so I don't expect you to contra contradict your own record I, I on would the public sector unions you, that have almost bankrupted this I state. I would expect a man of your experience to know that the legislature does not vote on contracts. But you supported the contracts. Okay, now uh, you're changing from voted to support? I, cor I stand correct. You do. And Richard always likes that when he corrects someone. So, uh, so, so. <laughs> when they're wrong, they're wrong. <laughs> Why do you think it bubbled up? Was it just what happened four years ago? Has this been a long time coming? Well, it's been a long time coming, and I think it was complicated by the Obama election, which raised expectations, which then turned into a reactionary right-wing populism, which the Tea Party initially sort of captured beautifully and could have continued to do so if it hadn't sold out to the large corporate interests. So there was always a, both a left-wing and a right-wing constituency that said there's something wrong with the way... Mm -hmm. the, the, the direction the nation's headed in. What the, the Occupy movement did was give it a slogan, and that's always useful in political terms, 99% versus 1%. Everybody got that, and then they could relate it to their own lives, and the, the result and is Tea me, Party Dom, yesterday. To me, Dom, that's today. it. The amount of people you run into, I don't care your politics who right, say, left wing, you know right what, wing. I never asked for a handout in my life, but it shouldn't be right. this hard to pay my mortgage. Right. It shouldn't be this hard to send my kid to school. It shouldn't be this hard you know, to put food on the table or to pay for my medicine or whatever. You get the drift here. When people read I am the 99%, if you forget the movement and everything else, they know that person. Mm -hmm. You know, they might know him, but they know that somebody just like him. That person is, is them. That person is you. That person is you, you and me. We all are either in situations, whether you're on television or not, or we know someone that we can relate to, we're either, they're looking at mortgage foreclosure, unemployment as you mentioned for the first time in their lives and this can't continue Richard to go on like this and so that's why Occupy folks are to be commended for putting this issue on the front burner there's no way around it and let me t tell you one other thing guess what debate number one between Mr. Romney and Mr. Obama you better believe these issues are going to come up as you have pointed out solely because of Occupy Wall Street well, and I hope there's a, a, the other point is made. The individual stories are compelling, and, and the individual difficulties we face is something that we can all relate to. But when we had greater equality, when we had greater, uh, less separation between the 1% and the 99%, the country was at, it, w was at an improved performance mm. level. The country performed better. We had our best years, you know, after the, between the Second World War and 1980, where everybody's boats yeah, not rose. Not if you're in the 1%. <laughs> These are the best. This is the, this is the golden era for the, over, for the one percent. But for the overall of the country, and it's it's not just the It's not just for the good of the ninety nine percent. It's for the good of the country. Well, I want to read, and I know uh, we got so much to get to, and we don't have enough time. Real quick, I just want to read some comments that have been coming out on Facebook on the same question that we've been posing to you um, on our phone lines, and uh, this first one saying, "You say have and have nots. Um, that's the answer. It is a class war." Our next posting says, 
uh, the one percent have robbed the banks and should be held accountable. How is it fair that 99 percent are left paying for this crime? And finally, we get to uh, from Peace and Compassion who says, when you have workers' wages stagnant or going down, working more hours for less, yes, I think the economic gap is too big. All right. Now, we hear from a disabled vet now in her own words about why she supports the efforts when it comes to Occupy Wall Street. I am a disabled veteran. I have two college degrees. I'm working a temp job to make ends meet until I find a job in my field. I'm supporting two kids and paying off $22,000 in student loans. I love my food stamps because I don't have to worry about my kids going hungry. I am the 99%.